Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the Weekly Comic Book Review. It's the show I read a lot of comics, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. And this week's pick of the week, Uncanny Valley, issue number one from Boom Studios. Now, this is written by Tony Fleece with artwork by Dave Wachter, and this is a phenomenal book. It kind of has an inspiration from things like Cool World or Who Framed Roger Rabbit in that it's dealing with both the real human world and a cartoon world as well. And in particular, it deals with a family who has heritage in both sides of that, right? So it's about this kid who finds out through the course of this first issue that he is descended from cartoons and he's a half breed, right? So he's got, he's half human, half cartoon. And the way that Tony and Dave kind of show this in the story by not just telling us, but showing us with cartoon language that is pretty much universally known and understood, I think that's exceptionally well done. The artwork is amazing. Wachter's artwork has a sense of grounded three-dimensionality and realism to it, but then when the cartoon world starts coming in, they're flat, they're almost, they're just two-dimensional. It, it has a really cool effect. I'll show you something. So if you look at just the artwork there, it's going to have a very realistic style. Now this is the same cat, <clears throat> excuse me, the same cat who was recently doing The Punisher with Dave Popose. But when the cartoon world comes in, it looks straight up like a cartoon, and Dave Wachter does both styles absolutely phenomenally well. It's incredibly well paced. It gives you all the information. It gives you an introduction to the characters in a very succinct way. It's paced excellently and it is executed flawlessly. The lettering is solid. The coloring is amazing. And all in all, this was a real fun book that did exactly what an issue number one should do. Introduce the characters, introduce the concept, and then have you end on a cliffhanger that makes you want to come back for the second issue. Tony and company, they did it again here in Uncanny Valley, issue number one. That's your pick of the week. Let's jump over to DC. We've got Action Comics 1064, the first part of the House of Brainiac story. Now, we know that in the upcoming uh, big DC event for the summer, Absolute Power, there's going to be like a new trinity of evil, right? If you got a trinity of good with Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman, we're going to have a trinity of evil that's like Amanda Waller, um, Failsafe, Zura and R Batman, which has been going on in the Chip Zdarsky's book, and Queen Brainiac. Now, we don't really know much about this character, but this is where it's all going to start. But what happens here is that Brainiac shows back up in Metropolis, and he's he doesn't just have himself with him. He's got a lot of guests, and it's an interesting concept trying to figure out what's going on, but the way that the story was told was big. It was epic and it had the scope to it. I always talk about when you do a Superman book, we got to have awe-inspiring pages when we first get introduced to the Man of Steel. Look at that. That is how you do it. And then Jeff, Josh Williamson, my bad Jeff, who's Jeff Williamson? Josh Williamson knows the lore of Superman and he knows all bits of it. And he he's taking what people like Jeff Johns or Jeff Loeb have done and even older school stuff and he's like making something new and fresh and doing his own thing with it. But it's a really interesting mini or it's a really interesting start to this crossover. So this is going to cross over between Superman and Action Comics, both written by Josh Williamson. It'll also have some tie-ins here and there with like Power Girl, a backup story in this week's Green Lantern. But the main stories in Action and Superman, and I think there's like a one-shot or two that's going to be along the way. But I had a lot of fun with this. I thought it was solid. I really like what Williamson's been doing in the pages of Superman. So to see him go into like a big super event like this absolutely works for me. Action Comics 1064. Josh Williamson also delivers Batman and Robin issue number eight. This is the second part of this new arc in which, uh, what's her name? I wanted to say failsafe, but it's uh, the Flatline, Flatline. Flatline is kind of like Damian Wayne's 
sort of girlfriend, right? And she shows up to meet Batman, but then there's other things going on, right? As well. And as well as that, the main thread of the story about who is the new mysterious villain Shush and what's going on with Man Bat, what's his new plan, why is he in such a supreme villainous role now, and lots of really cool artwork here. The artwork is from uh, Zamezia. I messed that up completely. I believe this is the artist on that Azrael Sword of the Bat Run with Dan Waters on the writing. So I like the artwork. It was dynamic. It was really cool. And it keeps along the momentum of what this series has been doing since issue number one. Then we've got Green Lantern issue number 10. 10 issues in. Jeremy Adams is really satisfying me <clears throat> in the pages of Green Lantern. I think this is excellent work. We have kind of taken time to rebuild the character of Hal Jordan, rebuild his world, and now we're enlarging the scope on that and taking it to the threat that's actually facing all of the lanterns, how that ties into the United Planets, and we're starting to introduce more of the lore and more of the auxiliary characters, and I think that the pace of that has done has been done so well in this book because it starts just kind of focused on how, then reveals some of the gaps stuff now it's showing us the ultimate threat that is looming on the horizon and it does it in an excellent fashion now the backup story is focusing on guy gardner and it touches on an aspect of house of brainiac that i wouldn't say is 100 essential but definitely something cool to check out Art's great, story's been super solid and consistent. Green Lantern continues to shine. Then we've got Outsiders here with issue number six, which is the most direct connection of Planetary that this book has had. Now, when this book first started, we were promised that it was not just a spiritual sequel to Planetary, but an actual sequel to Planetary. Planetary is one of my favorite comics ever. I'm thinking about doing a top-down look at the first issue. If you want to see that, let me know in the comments. But this gets right to the heart of the matter, and what I'm talking about is the snowflake that is the shape of all of reality. That gets uh, explored a little bit here. Some more stuff about Lucius Fox. It's the writing is starting to get a little clunky, especially in the dialogue, but there are some revelations at the very end that had this planetary head very excited. So the book has been kind of waning, but it's ramping up that connection to the original work by Warren Ellis and John Cassidy. And I am here for that to see how these ideas get explored in the DC universe. But Outsiders number six was pretty decent. Then we've got Batman the First Night issue number two. I thought the first issue of this was just kind of okay. And that's what I feel about the second issue. Now, I will give this the cover of the week. Mike Perkins doing an amazing job with an eye-popping uh, com uh, composition that's going to really get your attention when you're walking across the comic or the comic racks this week. But uh, this is Batman's first few weeks in 1939. DC Black Label, Mature Readers, written by Dan Jurgens. And it's okay. I mean, it's not anything that we haven't really seen before and honestly told even better as far as the writing perspective. Now, as far as the art goes, the art is amazing. Mike Spicer's colors really work with Mike Perkins' moody and atmospheric uh, <clears throat> line work and, and inking. Lots of great like shadows and black work and all that kind of stuff. So I really, really like the art in the book, but the story's just not grabbing me. Now on our monthly review at the end of March, it seemed like everybody was fully on board with this one, except for me. So just take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But if you like Elseworlds, original pulpy 1939 Batman origin stories or, or starting stories, it's not origin story. <clears throat> it's not going through all of that again, but it is like Batman Begins in 1939 with Dan Jurgens getting new use a little bit of a potty mouth so that's cool but a great cover so cover of the week from marvel i didn't read too much from marvel this week but we do have ultimate x-men issue number two written and illustrated by peach momoko i know a lot of people were kind of disappointed by the first issue of this and i liked the first issue of it but i just don't think it worked as a very exciting and enticing first issue the second issue though really starts pulling me in because Peach Momoko's playing with Japanese folklore and in particular Japanese horror folklore, right? And that's kind of her background, right? She used to do these like gnarly 
horror illustrations and stuff. If you look them up, they're really twisted, really cool. Now, she's not going that far in the pages of Ultimate X-Men because this is still a Marvel book, so it's a little bit more kid-friendly, if you will, but still it toned down just a little bit, but still a little spooky and unnerving and unsettling, and I love it. So I'm really into the artwork. I'm into the story. We get introduced to this new character who seems like she's Storm, but I think she's just more inspired by Storm. But real cool, creepy visuals. Peach Momoko has stated that this book is building up to the new X-Men team of this Ultimate Universe. You gotta remember, everything's different here. Spider-Man's different. Black Panther's a little bit different, but Ultimate X is definitely really different. It's not focusing on Wolverine or Storm or Cyclops. They're not even here. It's about armor and this new character and what I think is going to be the ultimate Shadow King. But I did really like issue number two. I thought one was I, but I really liked issue number two. Then we got Fantastic Four here with issue number 19. Issue 19 of Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four is my favorite comic book in my life. I will always collect it. I will always read it. And I've been a little bit disappointed in the Ryan North run. I think it's all right. Some of these stories are really sharp. Some of them don't really work so well for me. But it's been the art that I have the biggest problem with. In particular, the coloring. This one, though, is mostly black, white, and red. And it's a different artist, and it's not colored in that plasticky, like, liquid color late 90s kind of way, because it has that noir uh, kind of, like, aesthetic to it. And it works. I really did like it. It's a nice kind of simple story. It's basically a, like, 40s film noir story of a private detective um, trying to figure out this mystery, and the mystery is where did Reed Richards go, Susan Storm, if it's like a different reality, that gets revealed as to why by the end of the issue, so it's a nice one-and-done self-contained story with some pretty solid art. So what we typically expect from Ryan North's Fantastic Four, but with the art being a little bit better, which makes it work more for me. So Fantastic Four 19, I did really enjoy that. Then Weapon X-Men number two, I remembered liking Weapon X-Men number one, which is a story about a Jean Grey from another reality trying to stop another reality's onslaught from going to another reality and taking all of the power of that reality to end all of reality. I think that's, I think that's right. So anyway, she has a team of Wolverines across the multiverse, right? She's got the Earth-X Wolverine. She's got uh, a Marvel Zombies Wolverine. She's got a Wolverine from a world where it's actually Jane Howlett, and she's a woman from like the early 1900s or late 1800s or something like that. Um, and of course, the Weapon X, the Wolverine of the Age of Apocalypse. So it's a cool kind of team. And I wasn't expecting to like this book as much as I did when on the first one. So when the second one came out, I actually was thinking... Maybe I could just skip it, but I did like the first one, so I was like, you know what? Maybe it's going to lose me on the second one, but it didn't. It didn't at all. I liked this book. It's humorous, and it's fun, and it also has, like, some heart to it, which is really interesting. Now, the big story, the big plot, a lot of the melodramatic stuff happened, is kind of just silly, right? But there are certain things that are done with certain of the Wolverines that are, that are very funny, and other things that are rather poignant. So, two issues in, and... I'm liking Wolverine or Weapon X-Men. Wolverine's Weapon X-Men. That's what we should call it. The Incredible Hulk is here with issue number 11. And I was really waning my interest on this book over the last few issues. And even at issue number 10's review, I said, the inconsistency on this art is causing an inconsistency in the tone of the book, which makes it feel disjointed and jarringly so. So much so to the point that I'm thinking about stopping this book, which I thought was really good when it started, especially when Nick Klein is on the page. After reading this one, I feel exactly the same way. In fact, if Nick Klein is not back on the next issue... And the art is just, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this art. It's fine, but not for this Hulk story. Not for a Hulk story, and definitely not for this one. It's just not working. It doesn't have grit. It doesn't have texture. The coloring's fine, but the art itself, especially when you're in that zone, wanting Nick Klein and we're not getting it, like, that's a great cover. That's gnarly. That's the aesthetic that we need for this book, but it's not providing it, so... I don't know, I might be out on this book. What are y'all thinking? Let's jump over to Image Comics. And from Image Comics, we have Rat City, number one, the debut of a brand new Spawn book in the new you, right? But this is set in the future. You can kind of think of this book as Spawn 2099, even though it's actually set like 
10 or 20 years after 2099. So, but that's just a way to kind of understand what this is, right? It's a futuristic, powered by nanotechnology through his prosthetic legs, Spawn. Now it's not Al, it's a new host for Spawn, but Al is somehow responsible for it because there was something he did with the necroplasm explosion. Was that the 350 stuff? I've already kind of forgot, but it caused a ripple through space and time, so it goes into the future and infuses this dude with the Hellspawn powers. It's set in the future, but the book was very clunky. It's a long book. It takes a while to actually get to where it's going, and everything that is trying to set up to get where it's going is kind of boring and clunky, and it just doesn't work for me. I love reading the Spawn books and being invested in them but they are about to add a whole bunch of Spawn books right now. So we're going to have to start being a little bit more discerning about which ones we're reading. But on issue number one, Rat City just didn't do it for me. But we'll see what happens in issue number two, because that's where it should really be ramping up. Because this was just kind of a long buildup to get to the point of introducing the concept of the book. So I thought it was just kind of I if that. Then we got The Scorched, though, with issue number 28. And I've been really loving The Scorched. I like it when Sean Lewis was doing it. Now I'm liking it now that John Layman's doing it. The story's really cool. It's tying into some old school Spawn stuff that I really, really like. The Agency is back. They are after The Scorched. The Scorched are after them. Of course, since the results of Spawn 350, none of The Scorched except for Haunt have their powers. None of the Hell Spawns do. None of the Agents of Heaven or Hell. So it's interesting to see this take on them and still doing their mission and having a new mission being to hunt down this agency, who is running it, finding out all the nefarious plans behind that. So I am enjoying Scorched and that's a pretty dope ass cover. Then we've got Transformers here with issue number seven. This is the first issue of Transformers not drawn by Daniel Warren Johnson. Now that does make me nervous because one of the things that makes this book so exciting and so kinetic is that incredibly dynamically charged artwork from Daniel Warren Johnson. Now Daniel Warren Johnson is still doing the script so the script has everything that you're wanting to have in a Daniel Warren Johnson Transformers book, which we've had been blessed with for six issues, now seven, which is tragedy, nuance, action, excitement, new revelations, interesting twists on familiar concepts. All that is still here, but now we got Jorge Corona on the art, and I'm going to tell y'all, the art rocks. It is so freaking cool. It has that same excitement. It has that same movement. It has that same energy as Daniel Warren Johnson, as well as the grit and the texture. But it also feels just a little bit more solid and a little bit more constructed, right? So it's like the best of what Daniel Warren Johnson was bringing with what Jorge Corona can bring to it that's outside of that. So the art is phenomenal. And the story is back in a slower part, for the most part, building up into some things, kind of dealing with some character stuff. But a big portion of this issue is Starscream versus Soundwave for the leadership of the Decepticons. And that was awesome. It was awesome. It was so freaking awesome. It was rad. This is why we read comics. Books like that. Transformers was awesome. Then we got Napalm Lullaby issue number two. It's a futuristic all other world type story by Rick Remender with Bingle on the artwork. The artwork is great. It's solid. It's about these two uh, people and their father who are on a mission to kill God. And it's not a Blues Brothers ripoff or anything like that, but the world is run by a theocracy and everybody believes that whoever's ruling this theocracy is God. They're trying to free society from this tyrannical um, overlord, and so they're finding a way to go into what they call heaven to kill God. Two issues in, it's been very slow. Very slow, but it's taking its time to build up characters without giving us just a whole bunch of exposition, but letting us as the reader kind of figure it out, but still with the artwork of Bingle actually being exciting to look at and pleasing to the eye. So I like the art, I like the story, and it ended in such a way where I'm like, okay, you got another issue. Let's see what we can do to really start ramping up the tension and the momentum in this book. And I think that will keep people into it because it is a little bit of a slow burn. But at the same time, so was Sacrificers by Rick Remender, which people said. And that book has turned into one of the best on shelves. So 
patience, right? Then we've got Phantom Road, issue number 10, Jeff Lemire, Gabriel hernandez Walter, Jordi Belair. I really like this book. It's not my favorite Lemire book on stands right now, but I do enjoy it. Every time I start reading it, though, I always have to kind of, it takes me to like half of the issue to start putting together, oh yeah, this is what happened in the last issue. So it doesn't stick in my mind like something like Gideon Falls did, or even the Bone Orchard Mythos stuff, or even... I know, what what else is it? Uh, fireflies, you know, those stick in my head. This one, not so much, but then about halfway through each issue, it brings me back up to speed. I get back into the vibe of the story. Then it ends, usually with a cliffhanger that wants me, that has me wanting to come back. The cliffhanger on this one, I'm just like, okay, I think we're about to get a lot of uh, explanations about what's actually happening in this book. It's been an interesting mystery, but it is time to give us some revelations, and I think that's coming. Then we've got I Hate Fairyland, issue number 13. I have so much fun with this book. This is a self-contained, one-shot type story about um, these two movie producers trying to make uh, a movie on Gertrude's life, and it's funny, and it's it's... It's kind of like satirical about Hollywood and the movie making system and, and how that works. And it's taking shots at certain producers and certain ways of doing certain things and movies and, and AI and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's poking some fun at things. It's a nice, like self-contained, one and done, I hate Fairyland story. There's other things on the horizon to build back up to. But these last two issues just kind of taking their time to do their own thing. I've been pretty cool. So if you've always been wanting to check out I Hate Fairyland, you can just jump into this issue, read it, and it will give you the vibe of what this book actually is, which to me, it's a pretty solid book. Then over at Boom Studios, we've got Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, The Return, issue number three, co-written by Amy Jo Johnson, the original Pink Ranger on the show. She played Kimberly Hart. Also written by Matt Hodson, Nico Leone on the artwork, Dono Sanchez Almara uh, on the coloring, Ed Dukeshire on the lettering. I really like this book. I really like this book, right? So this is Power Rangers 22 years later. They've disbanded. Some people are still trying to use the coin. Everybody's split off into their own direction. There's a big tragedy that happened back in the day that caused Kimberly to give it all up. She, in the last issue, found Trini's daughter. Trini in this world is dead. And so she kind of like tries to take Trini's daughter in. It sounds like that, you know, special that they just did last year, but it's not because it goes into a whole different thing where there's a daughter also, I'm not going to spoil things, a daughter of Rita Repulsa, and she's got a plan that the Power Rangers got to stop. I'm telling you what, this book is able to take something and like, it's able to take our expectations and subvert them in such a way that it keeps me guessing and keeps me on my toes and it actually hits to the heart of who these characters are and it's one of the best like Power Rangers where are they now type books I've ever read or out, out of all the specials they've done. It's incredibly well done. And I have been out of Power Rangers books for a while. I've been out of Power Rangers for a while. I've been selling out the majority of my toys. I have only a few left that are probably going to go very, very soon. But this book's pretty cool, and I'm enjoying it. I like it a lot. It's a nice, like, nostalgia with a little tinge of new. Speaking of nostalgia with a tinge of new, Thundercats is here with issue number three. I got the Rob Liefeld cover. You know I had to. Um, I'm really liking what Declan Shalvey and Drew Moss are doing in the pages of Thundercats, taking the lore that's very familiar but kind of tweaking it and playing with it and doing something different, but it doesn't have that level of excitement or enthusiasm that you're getting in Transformers or the G.I. Joe books from the Energon universe or even in some of the other things that we're seeing that are really like making some waves in the industry right now. So Thundercats is cool, but maybe it's taking too much time to build up, right? Maybe it's taking just a little bit too much time to build up. It could be a little bit more dynamic. It could be more exciting. That's my only nitpick with the book, but I'm still enjoying it three issues in. There is a new Thundercat, Calica. Um, she was introduced and kind of over-explained in the last issue. It puts this issue in a little bit of cliche territory, but at the same time, like I said, I enjoyed it. As long as Rob Liefeld's doing covers, I'm gonna get them. I mean, why? Because I'm a sucker. All right, then we got <laughs> Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees, issue number five. A great issue of Beneath the Trees. This has been a really great crime fiction, fiction book that's kind of like based on something like Dexter is what I hear. people. A lot of people have compared it to Dexter. So it's like these storybook, like talking humanoid uh, animals 
right? And they look like they're from like a kid's book, but it's actually about the serial killer. And then there's another killer in this town. And the serial killer in this town has done such a good job that nobody's ever expected her of being a serial killer because she has certain rules that she goes and follows when she goes and kills people, right? And so somebody else has found out her secret and is starting to mess everything up for her. So this is a big introspective issue that has to this is like you remember that bit in empire strikes back when luke has to go into the cave and fight vader and it's like this internal struggle and he's got to like deal with it that's what this is to our main character and at the end you're like only one issue to go it's about to get real so i really love this book beneath the trees where nobody sees continues to be more solid than anyone thought it would be. Dark Space's Dungeon is here with issue number five, the final issue. What a weird final issue. It feels like it wraps things up too quick. And usually in these kind of stories, you're like, you wrap this up too quick. There's another twist coming. Then there's another twist and another twist. And I think I liked it. I like the concept of this story, but I feel like maybe it overstayed its welcome just a little bit. Maybe it was something with the release schedule because there was a big gap between a couple of the issues. Um, but it was a decent enough ending that had like a horror punch to it that I really did appreciate. Maybe I need to sit down and reread this all together. Now Hayden Sherman's artwork is absolutely amazing. And another thing, it's not as exposition heavy as a lot of Scott Snyder final issues are, but it still has all of that where it's like info dump. Okay, just so you know, by the way, that's what was going on. So it's kind of like that, but at the same time, kind of satisfying. So Dark Space's Dungeon final issue. We got a new publisher, Magma Publishing. Principles of Necromancy came out last week. We got our copies this week. Saw a lot of people recommend that I checked it out and I liked the artwork, but I didn't really fully get into the story. It's about this dude who's like a necromancer or something. He's taking like dead flesh and making them reanimated soldiers for him or something like that. And then there's this one really gnarly bit in here. I do like the artwork. The artwork's great. It's bloody. It's brutal. It's horrific. Like, look at that dude right there. So that element of it I did like, but the story just didn't fully connect to me. But I did really like the art and some of the concepts. So I might come back for issue number two and see how I feel about it. But I loved that cover. That was really cool. Also brand new this week from Magma is Silicone Bandits issue number one. This is from Jason Starr and Dalibor Talajik. Um, I like the artwork for the most part. Um, I think there's some good color choices here. I think the artwork is fine. The only problem is the story is dull. It's a been there, done that story that sh that tells over shows. So even though Dalibor is a fantastic artist, he doesn't really get to do anything much a bit except for just, you know, show some scenery and have a bunch of talking heads because this book is literally just people talking and exposition dumping all the information at you and like the first few issues i mean the first few pages of this are just a big info dump and it just goes on and on and on it feels like at least to me and then it continues and it's more about people talking about things than doing things and showing us things so everything that uncanny valley did right this one just doesn't quite nail for me so silicon bandits i don't know and the concept of it is the world is now ruled by like four corporations, artificial intelligence is taking over everything. There are these people building robots and they get fired from the corporation. So they decide to be silicone bandits. I don't know. It, it could have, it should have been more exciting and not as dull. It just didn't work for me. Then we got Monsters Are My Business, issue number one from Dark Horse. This is a new one from Cullen Bunn, Patrick Pizzalunga, Marco, Marco Bracco, and Jim Campbell. I really had a lot of fun with this one. This was cool. So it's about these monster hunters, um, and it's just, it's this, there's this dude who's like, just, just a badass, right? There's this badass dude. And then there's this woman who's like a powerful sorcerer. And then there's this cute little furry dude. And it's an interesting dynamic and team. And they're going up against just some wild, crazy stuff set in a world decimated by acid rain. But I really liked it. I had a lot of fun with this book. I liked the artwork. I liked the vibe. I liked that it didn't take itself too seriously. So if you like books that are about monsters and monster hunters that don't take themselves too seriously, Monsters Are My Business is definitely for you. Then we got a new one from Ahoy. This is called Deadweights. And this book 
Gets the smell of the week. Really love the scent that comes off of these pages. The art's okay and the story's decent, but it just didn't it just didn't have the execution. In fact, the smell was the best executed thing for me in this book. It's a little clunky, a little disjointed. But what it is, it's about these two supervillains who are like, I've had it. I'm done. Let's just be good guys now. And all the trials and tribulations that's going to bring, it's all right. It, it has some elements that work for it, but overall, it just doesn't land. But it does have some cool ideas. The artwork's just okay, but the smell, man, I'm smelling it right now. That's great. And a new one from Mad Cave, When the Blood Has Dried. This is a fantasy book, and you know, I'm not always the biggest fantasy guy, but it's set in this fantasy world about this woman that seems like she runs this bar. She's got this, like, dwarf who's, like, her assistant, um... Then this dude shows up and says something and everybody acts like it's a big deal. I have no idea why it's a big deal. I mean, it's cool. It's interesting. It's got decent artwork, but the story never grabbed me. I never got invested in the characters. There was that book from Vault called, was it called Quests Aside or something? About like the bar that everybody goes to to get their quest. It kind of felt like that, but a little bit more muddy. The characters to me didn't get clearly defined and I didn't really quite understand the purpose of the book and I just wasn't ever fully engaged in it. So didn't really dig on it that much. So that's what I read. That's what I thought. Let's recap. When the Blood Has Dried did not work for me. Neither did Dead Weights, but it did get the smell of the week. Monsters Are My Business might be your sleeper pick of the week. That was cool. Silicon Bandits did not do it for me. Principles of Necromancy had some cool ideas and great art, but overall just couldn't get into the story. Dark Space's Dungeon had an okay ending. Parts of it were satisfying. Other parts weren't, mostly in the execution. Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees, though, a great penultimate issue of that book. Thundercats, the best thing about this is the Rob Liefeld covers, but I love Thundercats and I'm liking this story, but I think it needs to kind of pick up the pace just a little bit. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the return number three, though. Wow. See, that's... If, it, if this had more of this, like the shocks, twists, turns, and surprises, and the amping up of things, emotionally even... That, that could really work for me. I Hate Fairyland. That was a really great self-contained one and done. If you've never read an, an issue of I Hate Fairyland before, want to check it out, you can do that. Phantom Road, number 10. Um, confusing at first. Enticing at the end. I want to know more about what's actually going on in that book. Napalm Lullaby needs to ramp up just a little bit. I think they're going to do that in issue number three. But issue two was still solid enough to keep on. Transformers, number seven, was awesome. This book was awesome. It was fantastic. Scorched, I'm having a lot of fun with the new direction. Rat City did not work for me. Took a long time to get to where it was going, and then it was over, so we'll see. Incredible Hulk, this might be my last issue. What do you think? Weapon X-Men is way better than I thought it would be, but it's not great. So don't expect greatness. Fantastic Four, one of the best issues of Ryan North's run so far, mostly because of the art, and in particular, the coloring. Coloring doesn't look overly plastic there. Ultimate X-Men number two works for me. Issue one was I, but issue two works for me. I'm on board. Cover of the week goes to Batman the First Night. The story's okay. The art is amazing. The Outsiders really leans into its planetary origins and inspirations very heavily. A little clunky with some of its dialogue, but overall decent. Then we got Green Lantern number 10. Jeremy Adams, 10 issues in. You're doing it. You're doing it. It's good stuff. Batman and Robin continues to be as good as it's been for the last seven issues. Then we get Action Comics starting the House of Brainiac in superb fashion. Great art. Interesting stuff involving Brainiac and other beings from the DC Universe. Then we've got Uncanny Valley. That's the pick of the week. Love the art. Love the story. Love the way that this is such a pitch perfectly first issue. Pitch perfectly done first issue of a comic. It's a great introduction. Uh, Uncanny Valley number one, though. Really like that. That's what I read. That's what I thought. That's what I dug. What are you reading? What are you thinking? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and join us over at patreon.com slash PCP if you want to help support the channel. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Station. Keep on reading. Pop, pop.